Great. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. We're very happy to have a, a, an informal talk from Rocky. Uh, I don't, don't know how informal this okay. would be. I, I prepared some. Uh, okay, sorry. I, I'll try to get my... So this is uh, a talk about a paper that appeared last Friday, I guess. So it's been on a week. And these are my collaborators. Si Yang Ling was an undergraduate here. I don't know if anyone uh, interacted with him when he was an undergraduate. He's now a graduate student at Bryce, uh, a student of Andrew Long, who was a postdoc here, and a student of Dan Chung, who was my student. So Si Yang is my great grand student. I guess, you know, when you're in the field long enough, you, you run across these things. And uh, Rachel Rosen, uh, is a senior faculty member now at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, most of us knew her when she was at Columbia. All right. All right. So why doesn't? Might get put back on the slideshow. All right. So this is about cosmological gravitational particle production, and the basic idea is that just the expansion of the universe creates particles from the vacuum at least if the mass is smaller than about a few times H, the expansion rate. And, you know, there's the lawyerly, um, you know, disclaimer, the particle, the matter Lagrangian cannot be conformally coupled. You know, you have to break conformal invariant somehow to do this. All right, and this is not optional. You can't hide from gravity. It's not like, well, I can turn some coupling constant off or on it's not optional, it's going to happen. And this is uh, what's usually referred to as a semi-classical calculation. There will be a quantum spectator field, in this case, the spin two field, uh, evolving in a classical gravitational background. So the complete quantization of gravity will be our next paper. So right, right now we're we'll just doing uh, classical GR. And the aim is to calculate gravitational particle production of the massive spin two field. And uh, let me be clear that this massive spin two field is not the graviton. So this isn't a theory of a massive graviton, which was very popular that people looked at this when dark energy came out, both we were explaining dark energy, et cetera. Uh, so it's not massive gravity, but it borrows a lot from that formalism. All right, so the basic idea when you teach or take quantum field theory, you only usually only do Minkowski space and you talk about particles, how they transform, you know, what's the irreducible representation of the point parameter. Um, but what you're usually not told is the expanding universe is not point for invariant. There is a time uh, evolution in the, in the expansion of the universe. And also the notion of a particle sometimes is approximate. <clears throat> and um, so the idea there's a cosmological expansion which leads to a time dependent Hamiltonian uh, which mixes the positive and negative frequency modes of the field which we will interpret as particle production. And uh, in the modern incantation, uh, modern view in quantum field theory it really started with the work of Lenny Parker in 65 and 66 and all of Lenny's students. And uh, there was a lot of uh, work in the Soviet Union and in, um, in Britain, and also, uh, you know, the worrying about quantum field theory and curve space time, Bob is worried about that. Uh, but it started an interesting paper by Schrodinger in 1939 called The Proper Vibrations of the Expanding Universe. Bob, do you know about this paper? Uh, vaguely. Vaguely, okay. So, it's sort of an interesting paper. It was published by Schrodinger in 1939 when he was a refugee, stateless, sort of being hunted by the Nazis. And, um, you know, he, so there's no author affiliation there because he didn't have an affiliation. He thought uh, with Germany and France about to go to war, the safest place to be was Belgium. <laughs> so, you know, he, he took a position in Belgium. Then when the war broke out, he said, maybe it's not so safe in Belgium. And it was, uh, you know, published soon after being received. And there's an interesting publication, uh, citation history of this paper. Schrodinger never cited it. And it was not cited for the first 
20 years that it was uh, after it was written. It was cited a couple of times in the 60s and 70s, but it's really taken off there. I, I don't know if there are many papers that would have a citation history like this. It's, uh, there's uh, it's a lot of history there that's sort of interesting. Okay, so why am I interested in it? I've been trying to work at this interface between uh, cosmology and particle physics, inner space, outer space, and, uh, you know, I've always told people particle physics can help explain the universe, dark matter, dark energy, baryonic symmetry, CMB fluctuation, seats of structure, et cetera. And uh, I tell my uh, particle physics colleagues that you can use the universe as a particle physics laboratory. There was big temperature in the Big Bang, and we can use this as, as an accelerator. Uh, the universe has long lifetime, long age, long path lengths. And you can use these to place limits on BSM physics. Stellar energy loss places uh, useful limits on axion properties, things like that. And there are large magnetic fields in the universe that we can uh, learn something. So let me talk about dark matter. Then I'll talk about the high bang temperature. Dark matter is that, right? You know, it, it, it's not a hundred... 30 GeV particle with weak interactions, I, I think that uh, that idea is over. So if it's not a WIMP, there are many other possibilities, axions, axion-like <laughs> particles. I don't know why anybody would be interested in that, but some of us are. Uh, ultralight particles, fuzzy dark matter, warm and fuzzy dark matter is my favorite. Asymmetric, sterile neutrinos, axinos, self-interacting, inelastic, cue balls, quark nuggets, hidden sector. But now, what um, think of the possible? What do we know about dark matter? The only thing we really know about its interaction is that it has gravitational interaction. So, suppose the dark matter only interacts with the standard model through gravity. How would you produce it? And that's where uh, gravitational particle production will come in. And uh, this will produce a mass is capable of producing a massive particle. Uh, that's known as the Wimpzilla. What is a Wimpzilla? It's a very massive gravitational particle production produced, production produced dark matter candidate, and very massive is something that's too massive to be a cold thermal relic. So Wimpzilla is your friend. And this is something I've been working on for a long time, going back to 1998. <clears throat> it's a list, I believe, of all of my collaborators who have written papers on this. Started out with a paper I wrote when Dan was a, Dan Chong was a graduate student here, and Tony Riotto was a, uh, my postdoc in Fermilab, and Kuzmin and Tikachev, who was a postdoc at Fermilab around the same time, wrote a paper, similar paper in 1999. Anyway, th there's a large number of collaborators, and I've learned a lot from them. And this is part of my long-term program uh, to calculate the one-point function, the, res the relic dark matter uh, density of massive scalar fields, conformal and minimally coupled, massive Dirac fields, spin, massive spin one fields, Rarita Schwinger fields, and now uh, massive Ferrix Pauli fields. And then, you know, filling in this matrix, you can calculate the two-point function, three-point function, et cetera. So that, that's what I uh, plan to do. All right, so that's a little bit about dark matter. Why I'm interested in it, it could produce dark matter. What about using the Big Bang as an accelerator? Well, the primordial plasma can create particles if the mass is smaller than the temperature. What is the maximum temperature of the hot Big Bang? Uh, in the pre-standard model days, they've been early 60s, sort of the, the beetle mania, era. Uh, people talked about a Hagedorn temperature this is before TCD, before asymptotic freedom, and the maximum temperature of the universe <clears throat> was thought to be, well, what we would now call lambda QCD, a hadronic scale. And the idea is that if you pump more energy in the universe, you produce more and more massive states. And uh, then it was realized after the standard model, after QCD, after asymptotic Freedom, it was thought that the maximum temperature was the Planck mass. So this was maybe fetal mania. This is uh, 
uh, maybe the disco era. And then uh, after inflation, I guess the hip hop era, uh, people thought, well, the maximum change, the maximum temperature of the universe is the reheat temperature after inflation. The reheat temperature is the maximum temperature of a radiation dominated universe. Now we don't know the reheat temperature, presumably it's large enough to produce neutrinos because the effect of neutrinos is seen in the CMB. Uh, so it has to be larger than about an MeV and possibly the baryon asymmetry. <clears throat> but the maximum temperature of a radiation dominated universe may be as low as an MeV. So using the Big Bang as a particle accelerator may be uh, maybe not called for. But gravitational particle production can produce particles with a mass, with a mass much larger than the reheat temperature. Do we not need it a bit higher for BBM? Sorry? Do we not need it a bit higher for BBM? Yeah, maybe. And maybe the two hundred eight. This is not precision, but <laughs> All right, so we will study gravi cosmological gravitational particle production of a massive spin two field propagating in or responding to an FRW background. And we'll have the field content will be a massless graviton, a massive spin two fields, field, and fields necessary to source an FRW background that leads to this strange universe where you start with inflation go to a matter-dominated phase, a radiation-dominated phase, then a matter-dominated phase, then essentially inflation again. All right, so the story of a massive spin-2 field began in 1939 with the work of Fiertz and Pauli. But first, let me do something simple. Uh, just look at metric perturbations around about Minkowski space-time. So just start with the Einstein-Hilbert action and linearize the metric uh, about Minkowski spacetime um, and the uh, metric uh, and the linear perturbation be h mu nu. And when I write h without indices, this is the trace of h mu nu. And this is what you would get for the action linearizing the Einstein Hilbert action about, Min about Minkowski. So those would be the kinetic terms. For the, um, uh, for the spin to, for the graviton. Now we're gonna be careful about counting degrees of freedom. So you would think H and would have 16 degrees of freedom, but then it's symmetric, so you subtract six, there is age invariant, uh, subtract four, it has to be transverse and traceless, you lose another four, and uh, you can do the addition and you end up with two degrees of freedom, the helicity modes of a massless graviton. Plus or minus two are for the, you know, cross and plus. All right, now add a mass term, and this is what Fiertz Pauli did, and there are reviews of this that are good to read. And Fiertz and Pauli realized you could add two mass terms, one h mu nu squared, and the other is the trace squared. And you might imagine that you can add them uh, different masses for those two different terms. But Fierz and Pauli saw that if you do that, you introduce an unwanted six degree of freedom. You only want five degrees of freedom, two F plus one. So you end up with six degrees of freedom. What could be worse than having an extra degree of freedom? Having the extra degree of freedom be a ghost. So, if you calculate the mass of the ghost, it's proportional to one over M1 squared plus M2 squared. Aha, I can get rid of the ghost, send it to infinity uh, by having M2 squared equal to minus M1 squared. So this leads to the Fiertz Pauli mass term where M2 squared is minus M1 squared. Now, you can do this, but it's, interesting or something you have to think about, no symmetry enforces this. It's something that has to be put in by hand, so you think it might be a little bit fragile. And in fact, spin two theories <clears throat> will be haunted by the spectra of ghosts. And they do the number of degrees of freedom, it's as expected, start out with 16, 
transverse bracelet, there's one gauge degree of freedom left. It's symmetric. You end up with five degrees of freedom for the massless into the field, which is the polarization modes for plus or minus two, plus or minus one, and zero. All right, that was okay for a decade or so until Boulware and Deza pointed out that the Fierce Pauli tuning, M1 squared is equal to minus M2 squared, breaks down beyond um, quadratic order if you include nonlinear extensions of Fierce Pauli, connect the Fierce Pauli field to, um, to matter, and the six ghostly degree of freedom arises. So every time you kill the ghost, it can come back. It's sort of a zombie ghost. It's just hard to keep that sucker dead. And from 1972 until maybe 2010, it was thought that all Lorentz invariant mass of gravity theories were ghostly until DRGT developed a ghost-free mass of gravity theory. And they did this by introducing a second metric that they called a reference metric taken to be Minkowski. This was extended and completed shortly thereafter by Hassan and Rosen in 2011 into a ghost-free by gravity. And they realized that the reference metric does not have to be Minkowski. So the Hassan-Rosen by gravity Theory will be our starting point. The field cut. Sorry? That's the next slide. Good question. So the field content will be two metric fields, G and F, and coupling to fields necessary to source an FRW background. Okay, Clay, how does it couple to matter? Uh, this is the bi gravity action. There's kinetic terms for the two. To, to metric fields, something called the DRGT potential. I'll say a word about that in a moment. And matter Lagrangians. And in order for the theory to be healthy, ghost free, uh, you cannot couple the uh, same matter field to both the G and the F terms. So there's a there is a uh, matter field. I'll just represent it by a scalar field phi g that couples to the metric, a uh, scalar field phi f that couples to the f metric, and this DG DRGT potential, this term, mixes, it, it, it uh, describes the interactions between g and f. So uh, x here is sort of a square root of a uh, metric. It's a more elegant formalism if you use tetrads, you know, we talk about square roots of metrics, you know, you use tetrads, but this is the way it's usually written. Are you saying there are two stress tensors? Two stress tensors, yes. There's a stress tensor associated with G and F. Is that what you're looking at? Properly conserved? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you send them out. Right, but you need two. And uh, you, 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 you're always one slide ahead of it, or maybe two in this case. So after the sausage making and go through some field redefinitions, you're going to end up with a massless spin two, the graviton with two degrees of freedom, massive spin two with five degrees of freedom, and two scalar fields uh, with two degrees of freedom or a total of nine degrees of freedom. At this point, a good question is are you crazy to? Do the analysis when you have nine degrees of freedom uh, to track. Well, probably. Yeah, it, it doesn't. You can also write it. Okay. So uh, beta here is four numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, five numbers. And if you would have written written it as the square root of f. What you call beta zero would then be beta four. So, you know, thing that there's a symmetry like that. So it's just usually written that way, but you could have written it in terms of that. And the beta would just be different. Sorry? Yeah, functions of DNA. And in fact, we will take. 
uh, for the FRW, these metrics to be the same for the background. So th this is a delta function. That's what we'll end up with, but you don't have to do that. I was at translation of the reaction to do one structure, and that talking to the translation of the that one stress has to be defined one combination of equal metric. I mean, maybe you can tell me what I'm asking. You will play a very good patient. Okay, so there are five parameters, and uh, only three will enter a quadratic order. And uh, one will normalize, one combination will normalize if there's poly mass to be M. Then two other combinations will give lambda G and lambda F, which we will set equal to zero and assume that inflation is driven by uh, phi G and phi F, not uh, perturbations of the metric. So the masses are mg squared, mf squared, and m squared. m star that enters uh, that the coupling of v is just combinations of g and f. And uh, our old friend, the Planck mass squared is mg squared plus mf squared. All right, so we start in inflationary by gravity with a g sector as a metric, an effective Planck mass with a g sector, and a scalar field. On G, and the same thing for the F sector. And there is the DRGT potential that connects them. So that's, uh, the, yes. Oh, sorry. All right, now uh, we want to do perturbations about this. So uh, the over bar will always. Um, refer to the background field. So the metric is some background metric plus H mu nu uh, for G, same thing for F, F mu nu, a background, and K mu nu. And uh, this, we want both metrics to respond to the FRW background. So we will take uh, G mu nu bar equal to F mu nu bar. Sometimes people talk about proportional metrics where there's just some constant between G and F, but that constant can be reabsorbed into field redefinition. Now, this is called mirroring in the scalar sector. Uh, we're going to have a background value of phi G, a background value of phi F, perturbations by sub G, verify G, verify F, and this is the mirror mirroring that's necessary to have both fields responding to the FRW background. So there's one background scalar field phi bar that can be related to phi bar F and phi bar G. This class of backgrounds is stated by some kind of symmetry. What's good about having phi bar and phi F? because we want both fields to be responding to the FRW background. So there's but one- given that the stress, the energy of the two interesting is coupled, why should that happen? They are, they are decoupled, but they are mirrored. So this is something we're imposing on the theory that both the background for both fields, both fields see the, see the FRW background. So we want an FRW background that will be um, determined by phi bar, which can either be phi G and phi F. And uh, you know, that, that's where the stress tensor comes from. So there's an FRW background that the perturbations of the graviton are responding to. And it's the same background that the perturbations of the massive scalar field will be. So now we want, so right now the massive and massless modes are coupled. We can do changes of variables to have the massive and massless mode decoupled. So the H, which was the perturbation of G, and the K, which was the perturbation of F, we can uh, define new perturbation variables U and V. 
terms of H and K, and define new perturbation variables phi U and phi V in terms of phi G and phi F. And if we do that, then the U sector and the V sector decouple. So they can be analyzed separately. So this is what we started with. There was a coupling between G and F. Now there's no coupling between U and V at quadratic order. Uh, so there's a massless tensor identified as the graviton and a Planck mass. And there is another scalar field phi U, and I'll show you how these all coupled in a moment. There is a massive tensor field, V mu nu, uh, which has a mass, Fierce poly mass M, and uh, the Planck mass MP, and phi sub V. Everybody wants to see the full action. They are decoupled. So there is, for the massless sector, sort of a kinetic energy for the graviton, then the interactions of the graviton with the background. And for the V, for the massive sector, it's the same except as a mass term. And there's interactions of the spin of the, of the U with the scale of field. And this is again mirrored with the interactions of V with the scalar field. And then there's the scalar field U interacting, self interacting, responding to the background uh, field phi bar. And it's the same thing for phi V. So the modes are decoupled so we can analyze them separately. So this is what we'll analyze. This has already been analyzed, right? This is the usual massless graviton perturbations in FRW. All right, so for the spin two field, we're going to do a scalar vector tensor decomposition. This is uh, a standard thing that's uh, usually done for inflation and things like that. We're going to represent the four tensor V mu nu by variables that transform under spatial rotations as three scalars, three vectors, and three tensors. So we have scalar variables E, F, A, and B. We have vector uh, degrees of freedom G sub I and C sub I, and a tensor degree of freedom Dij. And these are subject to the con constraints that uh, C and G are transverse and D is transverse and traceless. And counting in real time is something that is difficult, but if you do the counting here, you end up and impose these, you end up with uh, the correct 10 um, degrees of freedom that you would expect with the mu nu. And uh, of course, you would suspect that not all of these are going to be dynamical variables. We're going to only have five dynamical variables. So at quadratic order, the scale of vector and tensor decouple. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to work in conformal standard time, CST. I encourage everyone to get the Apple Watch app that sets your watch to conformal standard time, right, right here, I have it. So uh, the steps will involve uh, removing non-dynamical degrees of freedom, express the field in Fourier modes, canonically normalize the kinetic term, check for ghosts and gradient instability, find the mode equation, and uh, the angular frequency. And you end up, of course, with a wave equation. And psi would be scalar vector tensor. And the um, angular frequency will be different. Solve with appropriate boundary conditions, integrate over K, and write the paper. You might say, how did this take two years to do? And I'll show you why it took two years to do.
So let's look at the tensor sector and prime will denote D by D eta, eta is conformal time with the SVT decomposition of the massless, of the massive spin two mode. This is what the uh, Lagrangian looks like. And we want a canonically normalized kinetic term. So we don't want the A squared here. We want the kinetic term uh, to be canonically normalized because we're going to impose canonical quantization relations. <coughs> so we want the momentum uh, to be canonically normalized. Then we're going to express it in terms of Fourier modes. And this little tilde will uh, uh, denote a Fourier mode. And we can take um, K to be in the Z direction and the Fourier modes will be the usual plus and cross components of the tensor perturbation. So the field equation, <clears throat> the mode equation is the normal mode equation. And the angular uh, frequency is k squared plus a squared m squared minus a double prime over a. And if the mass is equal to zero, if you set the mass equal to zero, ignore this term, uh, you end up with the mode equation for a gravitational wave, usual for a massless graviton, propagating on an FRW background. And this is familiar from anyone who studied the generation of tensor perturbations from inflation. So this is something you might, um, you might expect. That's the tensor sector. The vector sector is a little more complicated. Uh, so this would be the, the Lagrangian for the vector sector. And you can see that G is not dynamical. There's no uh, second derivative. <clears throat> There's no uh, derivative squared of G. So that can be removed. And then in Fourier space, after removing the non-dynamical degree of freedom G, this is the Lagrangian. And again, it's interesting to take the massless limit of this. The kinetic term here is proportional to the mass. And this term is also proportional to the mass. So if the mass vanishes, the Lagrangian trivially vanishes, and we expect to see this as the massless mode does not propagate vector, vector degrees of freedom. So again, canonically normalize, take K in the Z direction, define uh, chi plus or minus in the usual way, and you end up with the mode equation and the frequency is a little more, the angular frequency is a little more complicated than before, but not so bad. So the tensor and vector, something that's easy to handle. Uh, all of the garbage gets swept into the scalar sector. So as originally written, there are five degrees of freedom for the scalar sector. The, and well, six, the phi sub mu, u is decoupled, that's from the massless vector. You know that these are too many degrees of freedom, so you have to remove the non propagating degrees of freedom and define another scalar field, which is the combination of phi v and uh, a. And you end up with a scalar Lagrangian that looks like this. And you're still not done because uh, there's a coupling here between phi V prime and B prime. So there's another field redefinition to diagonalize the kinetic terms. So you end up with a Lagrangian involving pi tilde and B tilde. This B is different than that. And it looks like this. But, uh, Maybe it's not so simple. You can't read these. I can't read them from up here, so maybe you can't read it. These are the results for KB, MB, and L2, L1, L0, things like that. So there's a lot of terms that enter. So this is why you have a graduate student on this part. You know, I don't want to do the numerical calculation there.
So let's just look at the kinetic terms for these two scalar degrees of freedom, k pi and k b. B will end up being identified as a massive spin two scalar. K pi will end up being identified as uh, the infliton, one of the inflatons. But if you look at the KB term here, we've defined MH squared as 2H squared, expansion rates of function of conformal time times one minus epsilon. Epsilon is minus H dot over H squared. When you do inflationary perturbations, you recognize this as the first inflationary slow roll parameter. But now if M is smaller than MH, the kinetic term is negative and we, a ghost has arisen. So if M is smaller than MH defined here, the theory propagates a ghost in the B mode, the spin two sector. This is not a complete surprise because Higuchi showed that perturb study perturbations of massive gravity on a de Sitter background and found a ghost if M squared is smaller than 2H squared. In de Sitter, M squared equals 2H squared is called a partially massless point because the mass also vanishes at this point. So if M squared is equal to 2H squared in de Sitter, then the scalar component just goes away. So we find in a general FRW background, there will be a ghost if M squared is smaller than 2H squared times one minus epsilon. In De Sitter, epsilon is equal to zero. H dot is equal to zero. So this just maps is what you expect in De Sitter. And uh, in, F, in a general FRW, this surprised us. The ghost is not generally a partially massless point. It's a, if, if M squared is equal to 2H squared times this, the kinetic term vanishes, but the mass term does not. It's not partially massless. So here's a question from my wife, wise colleagues here. How should one regard a theory perfectly healthy in Minkowski spacetime, but is ghostly in a non-pathological classical gravitational background? Wise colleagues. So we say, you know, massive gravity is fine, but uh, we are, but it's only in Minkowski space. If you can imagine a, non-pathological classical gravitational background where the theory has ghosts, is it a healthy theory? How can we refine the by the causality in the Minkowski space if we carefully enough? We are in like a track. But for spin two or for anything? For the scalar is what I'm talking about. Like you know if you take a, a derivatively coupled scalar with long sign g by the fourth term in there's a background that you can see that you can study the then, then you say that's not a healthy theory, right? Yeah. So is um, DGR, DRG, DRGT, is that a healthy theory? Yeah. I, we will, I, I wanted to say that in the paper, but uh, Rachel spent 10 years of her life working on this. She was a little reluctant to say that. Okay, so... It, yeah, but usually there's a dispersion relation just in flat space that would detect the A causality in, mm -hmm. in the background, as long as the background doesn't have huge derivatives. Right. But this is just a, it's an FRW background. Yeah. You know, it's non pathological, it's so well behaved. That's something that. Flat space, I can find backgrounds that I've defined it. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's that's what I, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's the way the right sign is just like, if you have the wrong sign, it's like a strictly symmetric background problem. But if you have the right sign, if you have a particular time dependent background, I mean, it, it's not obviously a problem. I mean, unless you show you can start with like some situation that you like and dynamically evolve this, right? Because typically the theory becomes strongly coupled if you try to actually access this like signal. So, do you think we're living in the. No, I don't. 
<laughs> Sorry, I thought you were asking a, a, a question of principle, not a question of practice. Yeah, it's a question of principle. And uh, you know, there, there are people who uh, think of gravitational backgrounds with close time light curves, and they say, look, there's a causal propagation there, but you know, the background is pathological, in my opinion. So looking at a field theory in a pathological gravitational background, I don't think you learn anything. But this is sort of a non pathological Okay, so that's uh, that's a question. Sorry? Doesn't sound good to me. All right, so finishing this up in the scalar sector. Um, this was the Lagrangian scalar sector. And you know, there's mixing here, but at late time, the mixing goes away. And there is in the scalar sector, things are decoupled at late time. There's the pi mode, which looks like the perturbation of an infoton. Here, uh, B, B is the potential that's driving inflation. And for the B mode, this is the Fierce poly mass. This looks like uh, a massive spin two degree of freedom. So at late times and at early times, so at initial time and at late times, these go away and you get the usual decoupling. But in the intermediate time, things are coupled and uh, the integration is complicated. Or CN. Okay, so finally we do gravitational particle production. We have the mode equations for the massless tensor mode. This is, uh, this is the usual inflationary calculation. There is a scalar mode by U. There's a tensor and vector mode for the massive degree of freedom and a pi and B for the uh, massive degree of freedom. So we end up again doing the no degree of freedom left behind. You end up with nine degrees of freedom. So we have the mode equations that we want to solve. And we, of course, we need initial conditions. We use the bunch Davies initial conditions or the Minkowski initial condition. And then calculate um, uh, psi, at, and psi is for S, B, and T at late times when the mode is non-relativistic, subhorizon, and the evolution is approximately adiabatic. So then we can define a particle. Calculate the Bogliubov coefficient for the modes with wave number K. It's the Bogliubov coefficient. Um, of course, in principle, you want to do this at eta at conformal time of minus infinity for the initial condition, plus infinity, calculate the final value. I've learned that putting infinity into a Python program it doesn't like, so you, know, you have to be careful of what you do. Then you can calculate the physical number density of particles with co-moving momentum P of K. And it's related to the Bogliubov coefficient theta of k squared. So the total number density is integrating over all k. Um, so we have to pick a uh, inflationary potential to generate the background FRW. The hilltop potential now is the most popular potential that people choose. And you say magic words, alpha attractors, quantum string theory, you say asparagus, you know, you know, whatever. If you say, wave your hands and say magic words, uh, people love the go top potential. And uh, this is consistent with uh, all the CMB observations. And you can, from the CMB normalization to three significant figures, calculate the mass of the infliton. H during inflation, Hn. And uh, so this is what the potential looks like. It's very flat during the inflationary phase. And then uh, the, hill, uh, the field rolls and n equals zero is the end of inflation. And then it oscillates, it goes up to pi max and then oscillates 
about the minimum of the potential in a matter dominated universe. Okay. This is the result for the spectra for the massive spin two field, the tensor vector and the scalar B, which is the scalar component of the massive spin two field. Um, so this is the number density per mode K as a function of the mass of the spin two field and the mass is only taken to be above the mass of the ghost or the mass that would lead to ghosts. Uh, and the modes with K over AEHE smaller than one down here, uh, left the horizon before the end of inflation. If it's greater than one, it's always sub-horizon. Again, we only consider non-ghostly masses. There are low K oscillations. It's hard to see here, but you can see the low K oscillations there. We understand that it's explained. The high K oscillations here, which look like noise, is not actually noise. It is quantum interference in gravitational particle production. The uh, low K scaling of KQ is explained. The high K scaling, either K to the minus three halves or K to the minus nine halves is explained. And uh, the scalar mode dominates most of the, uh, the largest density is in the scalar mode. So there are two other modes. There's the B, the pi, uh, which is the second inflaton. So there are two inflatons. There's a scalar, which remains phi u, phi u, and the scalar pi, the fluctuations there. And uh, that was calculated. All right, so if the particle stable, what would the relic abundance be? Uh, well, it depends on the mass of the particle, the expansion rate at the end of inflation, uh, the reheat temperature, and this thing that we showed on the uh, A cube N would be the integral over um, A cube N sub K. And again, the scalar mode dominates. So omega A squared of 0.12 would be the dark matter. And we picked a particular reheat temperature of 10 to the 5 GeV. This would be the relic abundance as a function of the mass and the reheat temperature. Along the red curve here, omega A squared is 0.12. That is the uh, observed dark matter abundance. In the gray area, omega A squared would be larger than 0.12 in this area, it'd be smaller than 0.12. So this would be disallowed if it's stable, this would be allowed, and this would be the curve for dark matter. Is the uh, massive spin two mode stable? Well, I think this is a little bit model dependent. Uh, if you look beyond quadratic order, which requires the bi-gravity formalism. Uh, the V, the massive mode, can decay to phi V and phi U, or U and phi V, you know, th there would be decay modes. So you would expect it to be unstable in this model. And uh, of course, the decay width is Planck suppressed. So you would think it's very, very small, but then M may not be so small. So it's hard to see how this can be dark matter and be stable uh, over the age of the universe. All right, oh, good. Finally, summary conclusions, future direction. This is the first comprehensive, by which I mean correct, other people have played around with this, this is correct, study of gravitational particle production of massive spin two fields. <clears throat> we employ ghost free by gravity, two spin two fields, two inflatons. And what are the CMB implications of having two inflaton fields? We calculated gravitational particle production. 
Can massive spin two field be stable? If so, it can be a dark matter candidate. If it's unstable, but long lived, so it may not have a lifetime longer than the age of the universe, but it could still be cosmologically early universe long. The decay could have interesting effects and baryogenesis, entropy generation, decay products produce dark matter, et cetera. Um, we also studied another bigravity model that is more complicated than what I showed you. I, I guess I should have shown the more complicated one that this one's too easy, but I, I just showed the, the easy one. Um, there, the mass of spin two is stable. Uh, we derived a generalized FRW Higuchi bound, and we studied ghosts. Uh, and there are also gradient instabilities for the non-minimal model. Uh, what do they signify? Coming soon to a reviews of modern physics near you would, will be a review article uh, talking about the last 25 years of screwing around with things like this, cosmological gravitational particle production and its implications for the origin of dark matter a really snazzy title, the movie's going to be great. I know the movie rights for this are going to be hot. That's it. Thanks. Wasn't that fun? Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Yeah, Bob? Yeah, how, how did it get in there in the particle uh, production calculation? I mean, is there any basic difference between what one would find if you just had a massive scale of field and, you know, evolutionary, well, the background, the FLRW background, I mean, is there well, the a difference in the ingredient in them? Uh, in, in, the different ingredients are all in um, the angular frequency. So, for instance, if you look at something simple like the vector sector, I'm pointing here, but you can't see that. Uh, then uh, this is what you might expect if it's a scalar, but there's an additional term, which is neither uh, minimally coupled scalar or conformally coupled scalar. And um, for the tensor sector, if the mass is zero, it looks just like a uh, minimally coupled scalar. Uh, but then you add the mass and it's not a minimally coupled scalar. And, um, but for the scalar sector, the angular um, frequency is just complicated. So you don't get, is not, you, the intuition that you get from scalar fields that we all love helps, but it doesn't give the final answer. But yeah, I mean, are you getting, more particle production with this kind of you know, load equation than you would with. You mean at the end of inflation, do you get one particle yeah. per Hubble volume? I guess. Uh, sometimes, yes. <laughs> and, you know, and in. Um, here, uh, you know, you, there's big differences, orders of magnitude differences between the scalar vector and tensor polarization. So Bob saying, why did you go through all this work? Why didn't you just do scalar fields? <laughs> and uh, we, well, we uncovered the FRW ghost. Well, I guess the sitter is an FRW solution, but it's, it's a generalized FRW. So it took a long time. When we started this project, Rachel was untenured at Columbia. And since that time, she had a child, received tenure, took a le year's leave absence. And her, her daughter is now must be one year old and she changed jobs and is now at Carnegie Mellon. So it's been a long, the paper had a long gestation period also. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah. 
Mm. Well, as an oscillation around the minimum of the potential, the frequency is determined by the gap of the frequency. And the expansion rate is both decreasing at the oscillates above the minimum. So the stamp oscillation above the minimum. So my question would be what the higher yeah so that depends a little bit upon the inflationary model that you choose <clears throat> in this model in the uh hilltop potential there's a factor of 30 so there is a bit of a hierarchy between the mass of the inflaton which determines the frequency of the oscillation and h at the end of inflation now, if, if we would have done quadratic inflation, it would be a factor of two here, something approximately mm -hmm. equal to two. So you can engineer inflationary potentials to make the hierarchy a little bit, make a little bit of a hierarchy. That's the reason why I was using temporal Yeah. So if it would just be, say, a conformally coupled scalar field in the quadratic uh, potential, then uh, it, the inflationary production, the gravitational particle production, would shut off larger than uh, for a mass that's larger than the mass of the universe. So here you can go after the formula is not larger. Um, so, I should I not worry about something like um, Weinberg, the, the strong gravity pump theorem? Um, 